uh, kind of motivation for this talk. So I will be speaking about this quantum physics and the way how the reality is uh, kind of uh, the how, how do we now understand the reality in the light of the knowledge of quantum physics? And I will also mention something as a holographic brain and the holographic consciousness. So that's my motivation for today. So I will start with the scientific view of what the reality is. I am not representing here any scientific community, although you know I'm from CERN and, and uh, involved for many years in the uh, you know, physics, uh, particle physics on Large Hadron Collider, but um, that's everything I will say here is my personal opinion, right? So, before discovery of quantum physics world, the <coughs> understanding of the universe and, and consciousness and everything is based on materialistic approach where matter is primordial and life and consciousness actually comes at random. It's kind of the random combination of molecules and, and building particles where the consciousness comes about. It's also dualistic means that there is always a subject, me, who is observing an object outside, right? And uh, it's also causal. It means that <coughs> everything has its origin, so every object or every event in the universe has a, a reason, so that's this causality, and <clears throat> that's kind of the, these are the building blocks of the kind of, I would say, classical scientific view of what the reality is. And then, at the beginning of 20th century, people discovered that the subatomic world, the physics law and the nature of the subatomic world is very different than the classical one. And, and people uh, discovered the quantum physics world and under the light of this new kind of insight from quantum physics, uh, the, the concurrent, so to speak, scientific view is still materialistic, dualistic and causal, right? And I will kind of go in details into that. This whole <coughs> story is called the local realism. It means that space and times are kind of absolute. I know that <coughs> there is a general theory of relativity and so on, but still our perception of what the space and times are is that they are kind of absolute. <coughs> and the time arrow always, fl always flows from past to future, so that's the local realism. You know, as a result of all of this, we have now a kind of cosmological view what the universe is, which is mainly driven by the equations of general relativity here, and I will explain you in details how to build these equations, but <coughs> the consequences are also that we are living in the era of cosmology, the that the 96% of all what we are observing is dark, dark matter, dark energy, <clears throat> and uh, only 4% of what we are seeing is due to the ordinary matter, and I will kind of dispute these facts in some future talk, not today, right? So let me go <clears throat> back to the quantum physics, and I will be speaking about how substantial the low, uh, sustainable, sorry, how sustainable the local realism is. So in the light of quantum physics, I will kind of give you just a couple of uh, selected examples. So what did we learn at the beginning of 20th century is that the nature of subatomic particles is really very, very different than from our daily life experience. So the, one of the facts, for example, is that there is a wave-particle duality. It means that all objects, all particles, including you, everything is based from uh, subquantum particles, so everything actually doesn't exist unless someone look at you or this object. It means that the particles are behaving, are propagating through the space as a wave, kind of related to wave of probability that if you look at the given space or time, <coughs> then the wave gives you the probability distribution 
that you will find something there, but nothing else. So all objects in the universe actually do not exist until somebody observes them. <coughs> this can be very easily demonstrated in so-called double slit experiment that if you let the particle propagate and, and hit the screen with two slits, two holes, then the complete kind of complex interference patterns appear because the particle appearance on the screen is dictated by the wave interference, right? So that's very easy to demonstrate. And nowadays it's so <coughs> easy also to buy a cheap laser in the toy store so everybody can actually buy for three euros a laser and, and exercise this experiment at home. Very trivial, right? But what is untrivial is that in the moment when someone gets at least the hypothetical ch chance to have an access to the information which way the particle goes, whether through the slit A or through that slit, then the quantum nature disappears. So whenever there is a smallest chance to know this information, and that's the essential thing, then the reality changes, right? From the quantum interference to kind of classical particle behavior, right? So it leads many to the conclusion that the building blocks of our universe are information, not atoms or something like that. This can be also demonstrated with slightly exaggerated uh, picture, but here you have the same thing, particles coming, hitting the, this double slit, and I can have two detectors which are recording whether the particle came through this opening or from that opening. And if I can somehow monitor this uh, detector signals to see whether the first particle was up, down, down, up, and so on, then the screen, what we, have, what we will see, is totally classical, as if you shoot bullets through, through this kind of screen. So you will see one trace mirroring the opening here and the second one opening here. But if you dim the screen such that you will see less and less resolution, you will not see whether the particles, what, what the detector says, then the quantum nature, this interference, reappear. So that's, that's really amazing fact. So the, this, uh, you know, the, there is a huge difference whether or not you observe and whether or not the information can be accessible to your consciousness. And, and this fact changed completely the world, the reality, right, what you observe. Then there is a, another fascinating, I have, I apologize, it's slightly too technical, but you can do the, uh, this interference kind of experiment with this Michelson interferometer, and uh, that's the same thing. So you send one particle, and this is well known, that the quantum nature tells you that if the particle behaves as a wave, then it goes simultaneously through path one and through path two, right? So you have simultaneous appearance of one particle in both trajectories. And now there is a, another mirror here, which is responsible for merging these two waves and creating the interference pattern. But the experimenter can decide whether or not to keep or take out this last mirror, which decides whether the nature of the particle propagation was classical or quantum. It is a so-called Wheeler DLA choice experiment. So you can let the particle propagate through the system for seconds, let's say, and then at the last moment remove the, the last mirror. And what will happen that before the quantum, so to speak, wave nature of the propagation has to change in corpuscular, it, is, it should become particle, but the particle has to decide backwards in time whether he he went through that path or that path, right? So it means that observer, once it has a freedom to leave or remove the last mirror, then the wave must collapse backward in time. And this is an experiment again. It was repeated many times, which actually proves that the time kind of can, that you can reverse the order of time. So the 
time error will go backwards because the particle needs to go back and to change the t decision which has been made seconds before the time you remove the mirror. So that famous DLA choice experiment which tells you that time is something kind of illusion, right? But we know that from other sources, right? There are another, for example, quantum Zeno effect I like a lot because it tells you that if you are having an atomic transition, for example, that we know that every transition has some certain lifetime. But if you observe, if you re frequently measure the system before it decays, what is happening that the lifetime gets suddenly longer. So it, you can even stop time, that you can even stop aging, you know. I was wondering why my wife was always asking me for attention, and now I understand, because women, they understand intuitively the quantum physics, and they know that if you observe somebody, he will not get older, right? That's, now I understand. Right? So, I think it makes it even some advertisement, right? Okay, so here's the summary of what I was speaking about the quantum physics. So, there are many, many, many observations which are totally mind-blowing, contra-intuitive. Quantum physics is just weird, right? People wrote many books like Quantum Enigma and so on, so, oops. So there is this, uh, you know, particle wave duality, building blocks of reality are information, not atoms, right? Quantum entanglement, this is some kind of telepathy, right? Quantum tunneling, kind of teleportation, you can, you can find the whole mysticism in quantum physics, right? Quantum superposition, kind of simultaneous parallel realities. Delay choice experiment we have discussed. Quantum Zeno effect discuss interaction free measurement, many, many weird things. In the 60s, the fathers of the quantum mechanics actually coins the term quantum mysticism. And if you do Google, then there is still quantum mysticism. A lot of people are seeing the phenomena in quantum world as a, as a mystical, I think it's right. So, Quantum physics disregards all classical laws, right? Okay, so, so how about this materialistic, dualistic, and causal? So we said that quantum physics deny all, denies all of it, right? Objects are not real. They are only abstract wave functions, potentials to generate information, right? Consciousness deeply rooted into a reality such that the quantum physics waves collapse. At, it means producing the information. There is no room for object-subject duality, right? They are so interconnected, object cannot be separated from the subject and vice versa. So it speaks towards the unity, what we have been hearing uh, today a lot. Causality and time error kind of facultative, right? But, okay, so it's, it seems to be clear that the key issue, kind of the key ingredient for understanding of the world around us is a consciousness, right? And now I will be, I have to first explain what I mean by consciousness. So I am thinking or I am speaking about the self-awareness, ability to think, having a subjective experience. By the way, I will not speak today about that. There is a very interesting fundamental development in artificial intelligence. So many people believe that uh, the artificial intelligence can have all the <coughs> fundamental properties of consciousness. Personally, myself, I hope that it's not the case. But that's not the subject of my talk. What usually people think that if uh, observer is observing a reality, so how come that in my brain somehow it happens that I have a full mental picture of this room of, of people around me? So there are some kind of classical ideas that if, if you observe, if observer is observing some object in reality, then somehow the brain makes the, let's say, a picture of, of this object in the neural system inside the brain, kind of the physical duplication of what the brain sees. However, I don't think this, this uh, p 
picture is sustainable. And let me mention some basic facts about the brain. So all sensory signals entering the neural system are converted into a neurochemical signals of the same characteristic. It's amazing that if you compare, for example, the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second, with the speed of uh, sound, which is 300 meters per second, then this huge difference is just converted into the same signal which propagates through the ne neural system. But there are some other... The second... Right. So, in a way, inside your brain, there are only vibration, right? So, th there are all the signals kind of interfere with each other, and inside your brain are just vibrations, right? Then, th they were, they, there are studies about the memory location in your brain, and what people realize that memories information are not located in any particular area of human brain. Patients who had, had portion of their brains removed never suffered the loss of specific memories. They never forgot half of their family or half of the novel they have read, right? So if you, and, and people really did a lot of experiments with uh, animals, for example, that if you take a part if you do the surgery and remove the part of the brain, the, these um, animals will remember everything, but maybe slightly hazy, but still, the whole picture is still there, right? So, where, where are these memories located, right? There's a big puzzle. Another kind of observation which was clinically demonstrated that, uh, and I took that from Michael Taibo, the Holographic Universe book, that uh, Penfield concluded that everything we have ever experienced is recorded in our brain. From every stranger's face we have glanced at in a crowd to every spider web we gazed at as a child, everything is recorded. It means that every single event, every single whatever small it looks, it's all the time accessible and recorded in your brain. And it was demonstrated by clinical uh, searches that uh, people stimulate by electrical shock parts of the brain and they found that in some kind of um, region when the brain was stimulated by electrical activities, people re uh, recall the exact memories of events which pass, which happened 30 years ago, right? So that, that's kind of demonstrated. So whatever you have a, a kind of experience, it's deeply rooted and it's stored in your brain. And again, my, my wife is expert on that. She can always remind me what did I wrong 20 years ago. Sorry. Okay, so deeper meaning of that, it strongly suggests, it strongly suggests the holographic nature of the consciousness. And I will now explain you, I have to unfortunately go a little bit into the details, what the holograph means. The hologram is a standard kind of picture, as, as many people taking a picture with their camera. The only difference between the normal photography, the normal photography stores the light intensity at every pixel, right, at, on the photograph. Then you can look at the photograph and, and you see the two-dimensional picture. Here we use the quantum effect. It means that we split a coherent laser beam in the two paths, two trajectories, and one of these beams are used to illum illuminate the object, and the second one as a, is a serving as a reference beam. And in this way, the photographs, photograph keeps not only the intensity information, but also the phase difference between these two beams. Right? So that's the holograph. And then if you reverse the process and if you il illuminate with the same co coherent laser beam the photograph, then suddenly, instead of two-dimensional picture, you will see the whole three-dimensional objects, right? So that's the holography, right? That's kind of an example how the photograph look, looks that these are two spheres which are identical, and if you illuminate these two spheres, 
with the, uh, you know, using the tools as I described. So then, then you get the photograph looks like that. So it, if you look at the photograph, you don't see the object which is stored there, right? So it's, it's something else. But in order to recall the picture, you have to illuminate the photograph by coherent laser beam again. And this is an example when the spheres are not identical or displaced, you know, so that's, that's roughly what is in your brain, actually, right? And now, the amazing feature of the holography is that if you take the photograph and break it in many, many small pieces, then you take one small piece and illuminate by with the coherent light, you will always see the whole picture, right? So the small piece, small piece of the photographs always contains the whole, you know, that, that's so, that's screaming on you that has something to do with the consciousness and spirituality, right? Every little small piece contains everything, all information about the whole object. The only difference that if you illuminate the small part, then you see less details, right? Okay, so then it comes kind of the classical view how the consciousness actually might work, right? So you have a material world where you have a sensory information flow into your brain, right? You are observing the reality outside, right? And, and what the brain does, that it's actually all this interference of zillions signals which are coming not only from sensory but also from the information which is stored inside the brain, then there is an appearing hologram photography which can be observed, right, by your observer. We, we know that there is something which is thinking in your head but also something what is observing what you are thinking about, right? And then in this way the holographic kind of mental picture is created. I admit, no one understands how this mental picture is generated, but that's the kind of, I would say, the classical, classical view, right? But, you know, if you, if you take a carriage, right, and, and you bring it on the one step further, then you can find that there is an alternative picture. What if everything is reversed, right? And that's what I think is the picture where the science really meets the spirituality in a way that you can you can think about non-local idealism as a contrary to local realism, right? And and here I would say that there is a timeless mental picture of the universe mind, right? Call it as you wish. And then all realities, because it's timeless, it means that everything you can imagine, all situations all events, everything exists at the same time, if time doesn't exist, right? So it's simultaneous. And every piece of this timeless reality is generating corresponding holographic vibration pattern, right? So I, I took two of them. And from this pattern, right, actually the holographic object is created and this object is actually you, the brain, my body, the reality, everything, right? So in a sense, I can say that timeless universe mind looks through holographic texture, texture back at himself, right? So that's my picture how the reality works, that this timeless universe mind is looking through this hologram back on, and that's you, you know, all of you are these holograms, right? Anyway, so unification, picture similar to this one, is where, to my opinion, Western science meets the Eastern and Asian wisdom. We have heard, you know, about this unification, various kind of level of uh, consciousness and so on. It is not the end, but, you know, some people are having fear that will be the end of rational science. And I said, no, in contrary, but one has to, one has to just, one needs to admit that the reality is somehow generated by consciousness, it's uh, by, by our minds. Nothing is fixed and static. Even physics law are constantly evolving. That's what we are observing all the time. We think that the physics law, as we understand them today, 
they are the final world and uh, there will be uh, maybe in future we will discover theory of everything then we can forget. I am saying no, even the physics law, it's a democratic kind of, the, if we believe that there is some truth we can all agree on, it's a democratic principle, it's a democratic decision. There is no absolute right, rationality, true, but there are universal forces, love, harmony, beauty, and so on. As a concluding remark, that's, that's the thing I have, what I'm thinking is that the real truth always denies itself. And that's the only reason why the true reality doesn't have any limit. Because if there would be an absolute truth, and I'm happy if somebody will explain me I'm wrong, then at some point we can reach this truth and say, okay, now we understand everything, that's the end, right? And this, I think, will never happen. Thank you a lot.